We hear so much about the search for God. Yes, we, we even speak and write a lot about the search for God, seeking God, trying to become at one with God, making effort to contact God, And every bit of that is wrong. I wish I could rewrite every passage in the Infinite Way writings that refers to seeking God or searching for God or trying to find God or make contact with God. Because even though when I wrote those things, I knew what I know now, I was using the language of, of the religious world of scripture instead of writing what my heart felt. And so, the most I can do now to make up for it is to rephrase it in our classwork. There is nothing that we can do or think that will enable us to find God. There is no effort that we can make to find God that will be successful. If we could be quiet enough, God would catch up with us. Because that is the way the relationship really is. We are running away from God all the time. And the more we use personal effort, physical or mental, the more we are running away from God. The real true secret is that God is. And not only that God is, but when we say God is, uh, we're saying the same thing as I am. And so God is, I am. And that's oneness. And so the relationship is I and the Father are one. And every effort to make contact with God would be like Joel trying to make contact with Joel. It is already one, not two. Now the ability to relax the mental effort, the ability to read scripture, study it, the ability to read inspirational writings, and at the same time be relaxed will enable God to reveal itself to us. The kingdom of God is within us. There is no need searching for it anymore. As a matter of fact, there wasn't even a need before the days of Jesus Christ when he said the kingdom of God is within you because it had been said in other words thousands of years before the Master. But instead of accepting it literally, we have voiced it in words and then denied it by our actions. If the kingdom of God is within us, where are we going to go? 
what effort is necessary to find that which is within us but to be still as scripture says be still the eye will reveal itself and it will declare I will never leave you nor forsake you you can't search for it but it can say it to you in other words you find throughout the infinite way writings that we do not give treatment we get still and let God give the treatment within us you find all through the infinite way writings that we do not go to God for healing we let God reveal the truth of being the truth of your being or of mine the truth of the patient or student think how awful it would be for us to speak to God oh I'm sure God has many more interesting things to say to us than we could ever have to say to God and uh, we can hear all that God has to say by being still instead of seeking searching mentalizing now a new world opens up the moment we learn to be still mentally still as well as physically still as a matter of fact it isn't necessary to be physically still you can ride on about your work ride horseback do housework go to business do anything you like physically but mentally be still mentally open that inner ear that listening attitude and watch how close God is and see why the poet could so beautifully say closer than breathing nearer than hands and feet you imagine we are searching and seeking for that which is closer than breathing and nearer than hands and feet oh today would be such a good day to give up that search for God and let God search around a little for us and be assured God would find us right where we are yea though I make my bed in hell God will find us there if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death God will find us there why because with God it isn't a matter of searching or seeking it's a matter of knowing and being but we we do not let that come through it is as if the Sun were outside and we kept the shades down and then went searching for sunlight so it is with us because there is a a, there is a legitimate use for the terms seeking God and the search for God we have turned it into a physical and mental seeking and searching actually to seek for God or search for God merely means to recognize that we have not come into God awareness and so every bit of praying that we do communing meditating every bit of spiritual reading that we do every bit of attendance at lectures or services or classes is a seeking and searching but it is not in the sense of mentally trying to make contact with that's a seeking and searching that if anything would tend to separate us from God I feel so tempted to say that this is the secret of supply but here I'd be getting into something so simple that I'm afraid nobody but children would understand it the seeking and the searching and the laboring and the mentalizing for supply is about on the same level as praying for supply in the last depression when the world was full of supply more than we could use so much that we were destroying it 
And so it is with supply today. It isn't necessary and it never was intended that we should labor for supply mentally any more than physically. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do our work and have our occupations or professions, but that shouldn't be working for a living. That should be working for the joy of working. In other words, there should just be just as much joy in one's work, labor, or profession as there is in my work. Certainly, you wouldn't engage in this work for a living. You'd be very glad to do it if uh, there wasn't any living in it. Matter of fact, if you were called to it, you'd find that you'd gladly sacrifice all the living in the world just for the joy of being in it. But so it should be with any art, any profession, any work that we are called to do, it should be our joy to do it. Now, human belief, false teaching, has brought us to a point of working for a living, whereas our living is forever pouring itself through to us. And there's one wonderful way to get it, and that's stop working for it and let it catch up with us. You don't really work for a living. You don't really labor for it, although it would seem so at the moment. But every day your living is provided for you. You just wake up and uh, accept it. It's in your mail, or it's in your paycheck, or it's in the investment. But you, you have no labor to do. Your work is to do that which is given you to do, and do it for the sake of doing it, and doing it well, not for the sake of a living. The living has nothing to do with your work. Sometimes you find that you derive less income from your work than from the many other channels of income supply that open up. The only uh, illustration of this that is true is that of the child. The child does not work for a living, but it gets a very good one. All of its meals, all of its clothing, all of its housing, all of its education, all of its vacations, and it doesn't turn a finger for it. It doesn't even think about earning a living. It just accepts it from mother and father as its natural right. Ah, uh, yes, but we also have a natural mother and father, and that is God. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Of course, in the days when the master spoke that, uh, women weren't supposed to have quite the privileges of men, so we spoke only of Father God and not of Mother God. Mother was busy out in the kitchen and doing the housework where she belonged, in their belief, and so she didn't come in for the honors of being a part of God. But the truth is that your Heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things, but so does your Heavenly Mother. And your Heavenly Father and your Heavenly Mother is one, and that one is God, and that one is closer to you than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. The kingdom of God is within me. The moment we disassociate ourselves from the idea of making a living or earning a living or working for a living, and uh, agree that our work is in the nature of that which is given us to do today, two things happen. If our work is not of a nature that we at the moment like or enjoy to the fullest, just accepting it, doing it, and giving it the best we have at each moment will gradually lift us out of it into uh, what to us represents higher forms of work or more noble forms of work. 
At the same time, it takes us away from the idea of earning a living, and we really find that a living is ours by grace. Now, if God did not provide for his offspring, it would be a strange God. But God does provide for its offspring. It is we who have separated ourselves from that provision. Now, of course, the whole world has done that, but the metaphysical world has done it in greater degree and caused a wider separation from their supply than even the rest of the world. At least a good part of the metaphysical world has. And that is because of the word demonstrate and demonstration. And so we seek metaphysically to get health, to get abundance, to get home, to get companionship, or to demonstrate these things, when actually they are ours by grace. There's no need for us to make an effort to get them. God is making the real effort to get us to accept them. At first, it is a greater struggle to accept our good than it is to labor for it. We are so used to the idea of laboring and being worthy of it. Now the time comes to develop the ability to relax and let our living catch up with us. Let our living come to us by grace. Oh, the question comes immediately, why there's no possibility of that. All I can get is what I earn or what my husband earns or what my parents left me. But that's not true in the spiritual kingdom. That's not true at all. And when I say the spiritual kingdom, I mean this kingdom right here and now after we have given up our mental concepts. Earning a living, being worthy of it, laboring for it, that is a human concept of supply. The spiritual idea of supply is omnipresent. That's the same with health. The human idea of health is that it is something to be achieved, something to be accomplished, something to be demonstrated, something to be gotten. That isn't true. Spiritually, the secret of health is omnipresent. Why is this true? Because of the omnipresence of God, and God is all-inclusive being. God is the only health there is, and God is the only supply there is. And right here we come to a point that for the past year has been accentuated in the message of the infinite way, that strictly speaking, from a spiritual standpoint, demonstrating supply and demonstrating health are absolute impossibilities. Demonstrating home, demonstrating companionship are absolute impossibilities. There is only one demonstration that anyone can make, and that is the demonstration of God's presence, the realization of omnipresence. That's the only one, because God being all-inclusive, God includes health, supply, home, companionship, opportunity, transportation, talent, ability, genius. God includes those. So in demonstrating the omnipresence of God, automatically we find all things included. Scripture language says uh, all things added unto us. Actually, in the infinity of God, all things are included. Now, to think of supply, companionship, home, success as something separate and apart from God and then try to demonstrate them, 
there comes the impossibility. But to understand that God is the fullness of being, I am come that ye might be fulfilled. I am come that ye might have life and that ye might have it more abundantly. That abundantly means all the added things. Then the only demonstration we have to make is the demonstration of I. Once we have the I, all things are added unto us. The abundantly is made manifest. Now watch this for a specific practice. Just as last night we called attention to the fact of specifically realizing those passages in the infinite way, 97 to 103, which are a continuous reminder of God's presence, power, availability, and so forth. Now, as a specific practice, give up all desire for whatever it is that you desire. But you have to make a specific practice of it. You have to specifically declare and realize and actually mean it within yourself. After all, what would I do with health if I got it, if I didn't have God? What would I do with supply if I had it, if I didn't have God? What good would companionship be or home be if I didn't have God? You may think that that is not so, but I could refer you to some millionaires who have everything in the world but not God and who are very busy seeking that one thing and neglecting all the things they already have. I could call your attention to many people who are physically and mentally in perfect health and who are in utter agony otherwise. There is no peace, there is no satisfaction, there is no safety, there is no security except in God and through God. There isn't a happy person on the face of the earth except those who have found a measure of God. Oh yes, there is a temporary satisfaction to the youngsters in physical health in outer companionships and joys, in the handling of money, that's a temporary thing. And uh, even to them, I'm sure, that there come moments of uh, voids, moments of blankness, when they wonder what it's all about. But aside from the very young who are still delighting in uh, the uh, joys of the outer world, it is very safe to say that there's not a man or a woman on earth who has ever found happiness, ever achieved peace, peace of mind or peace of soul, except in the degree that they have found God. Now, many have found wealth without God, but many also have found that it wasn't a permanent dispensation and their experience. Many have lost their wealth for one reason or another and in one way or another. Many people have found health and then found that one thing or another comes along eventually to deprive them of it. But finding God, there is no way to lose health or lose wealth or home or companionship. There's no way to do that then because God is the health and the wealth and the companionship. It isn't that God sends it or gives it. God is it. God appears as one's health, one's harmony, one's home, one's joy, one's peace of mind. I think that the greatest lesson the infinite way has to offer anyone is this oft-repeated truth that we need seek and find only God and leave everything else alone. The Master gave it in his passage, Seek ye 
first the kingdom of God, the rest of these things will be added unto us. Now, to give up one's desire for health, wealth, companionship, freedom, joy, peace of mind, is the first step. Clean out the old house. Cleanse the temple of all of its desires until there isn't one single one left. Until there isn't a desire for anything or anybody on the outer plane. Until the heart says, My soul thirsteth, my heart panteth after thee. Oh, do you remember it? Only God, only God, only God. Spinoza, the God-hungry man. Only God, only God. Give me God. The whole world is well worth losing. Only God. And then you understand the meaning of the Master when he says, I have overcome the world. He didn't say, I have demonstrated the world. He didn't say, I have won the world or gotten the world. He said, I have overcome the world. He overcame all desires. He overcame all needs. Why? He had found his God. And in finding his God, he found all things necessary to his fulfillment. Now, of course, the things that filled him full may not completely meet our need. In other words, he found himself filled with companionship even though he didn't have his mother and his father and sister and bro brothers. He was well satisfied to be without them and to be without friends because he was completely filled with his God. With us, that may not at once be the case. Our fulfillment may take the form of friends, relatives, family, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife. God may fulfill itself in our experience as uh, companionship on this level, fellow students and so forth. I'm sure the day would come, though, in this uh, experience or another, when we also would have the feeling, no, none of these mean anything to me except you, my disciples. Only you who are spiritually one with me constitute my fulfillment. I couldn't be happy, the Master couldn't be happy with mother, brother, or sisters. The Master couldn't be happy with kings, emperors, or princes. He couldn't even be happy with the rabbis of the church. His only happiness was in his disciples, his students, his apostles, those who were of his household, of his own consciousness. And so I'm sure that in time all of us will come to that same place when we will have very little interest in anybody in the outer world, regardless of their blood relationship, unless they are of this spiritual household. And then we want to spend all our time with each other. And this will be our companionship. And this will be our fulfillment. And we will find God in and through and with each other. In the same way, as we find this God, we find our food and drink, bread, wine, water meat. And uh, we find it in each other's company. And I think you'll find that even though we enjoy the food and enjoy certain kinds of food, that the real enjoyment that we are getting from it is not from the food but from the company of those that we are eating with. Whether we are eating by the seashore a few fishes or in the mountains a few loaves and fishes, or whether it is some feast. The joy would be the same 
if it was in the companionship of those of one mind, of one consciousness, of one soul. I'm just thinking now of Mrs. Crow and her thoughts on uh, the letter. Oh, uh, we had had no talk between us of such a nature. I merely asked her to remind you about the letters. But may I tell you right here that that is in its exactness and fullness my idea of those letters. My work began with letters twenty odd years ago. And the whole idea behind them is that it is a point of contact between the student or the patient and myself. And because of uh, the degree of oneness that I experience with the Father, that makes the degree of oneness with you and uh, through you and the Father all one in one place. And that is the idea of bringing that letter to life again. The fact that it makes for a continuity of contact. Now you are already part of that contact through reading the books or hearing the tapes. And yet that letter adds one more link to the chain of conscious oneness between us. And not only between us, but between us and the Father. Now, I felt that way, Mrs. Clow felt that way, yet without the spoken word, it came out in actually the same language that I would have used had I introduced the subject to you. Now that is what I mean by the fullness and fulfillment of God in our experience. It isn't necessary that we be blood relatives. It isn't necessary that we be social friends. We are closer than blood relatives and closer than social friends because we are in and of the one consciousness and that consciousness must be God if it voices itself in just the same manner for a universal good. Now, this can only come about when we have no desire that concerns letters, when our desire isn't to give or send or sell letters, when the desire is God contact with God and with each other, then do you see how it fulfills itself in a practical way on the outer plane? So it is in every expression. Have no desire for a home. Have no desire for a companion. Have no desire for money or supply in any form. But keep thoughts stayed on God. Learn to meditate. Be quiet. Be still. And let God catch up. Let God touch us with its finger. Let God reveal itself to us. And uh, God revealing itself, manifesting itself, will appear in our outer form as the things necessary to our daily living. And so you see, we start today on uh, two, no, we're going to, before we're through, it'll be three. We're start, going to start with three major points of uh, demonstration. Yes, it is true to uh, give this properly, I should only give one point, and I should leave it with you for three months and then come back and take the second point, and then come back in three months and take the third point, but the world won't let me. So I have to give you three points at once, and hope that you will put two of them aside. Don't try to demonstrate all three. Take one at a time and uh, fulfill yourself with one before you take up the other. And the first one is that idea of not seeking or chasing God or looking for God or searching for God, but make the acknowledgement, I have found God. The place whereon I stand is holy ground. Why? Because I'm there or because God is there? And that's very clear.
the place where I stand is holy ground because God stands there. Why search for God that's standing in my shoes? The kingdom of God is within you. Then why search anymore? Just acknowledge. God is closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. Why search anymore? Why seek? Why not make the acknowledgement? Thank you, Father. I and the Father are one right here and now. The place whereon I stand is holy ground. Makes no difference if where I'm standing is hell. Please remember this, that at some time and some place in our experience, each of us stands in hell. It may be the hell of sin. It may be the hell of disease. It may be the hell of lack and limitation and unemployment, danger, insecurity. All of those things really are what we call hellish experiences, devilish experiences, horrid experiences. But they become transformed when you realize that even in the midst of this hell, thou art there. I still do not have to search for God or seek for God in hell, for thou art there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Many people in their disease or near death believe that in some way they have become separated from God. And then they struggle and strive to find God. It's all wrong. That's all wrong. You are no further from God ever than you are from your own breathing, from your own being. You haven't gotten separated from God. You have merely let the word I, me, and mine get in too much and set up a sense of separation from God. That's not separation. That's like misunderstanding a friend and deciding never to talk to them again and cutting yourself off from them and they're still your friend. You haven't cut yourself off from their friendship. You've just entertained a sense of separation. Now, the sense of separation will act as disastrously as separation itself. In other words, the moment you accept a sense of separation from God, it is as if you had no God. So the thing to overcome is not a separation from God, but the sense of separation. And there's one way and one way alone that you can overcome a sense of separation from God. And that is to acknowledge God's presence regardless of appearances. No matter what the appearance may be, roaring lions jumping into this room, gunmen jumping in and shooting off guns or atomic bombs floating in air, those are the appearances that would tempt us to believe in a separation from God. Horrible sins, terrible diseases, these are the things that tempt us to believe in our separation from God and we become victims of that belief. Now then, to give up the belief of separation, you have to do it in one way and one way only, and there is no other way, no other way that's ever been discovered, and that is to acknowledge the activity and presence of God where I am. The Father in the midst of me doeth the work. Not the Father that I'm seeking or get, going to get at one with, not the Father that I'm searching for or hoping to attain or expect to be worthy of, no, no, no. The Father within me doeth the works when? Now, when I acknowledge it. Because of omnipresence. Omnipresence means always present. Is God omnipresence or is God sometimes away somewhere? No, there's no place for God to be away to since God fills all space. And since God fills all time and God fills all space, God is here where we are. And the only way to achieve the activity of God, the blessings of God, is to acknowledge, in spite of appearances, thou art there. 
thou art here. I shall not fear what man can do to me. I shall not fear what mortal man can do to me. I shall not fear what circumstance or condition can do to me. I shall not fear what anything, time or space, can do to me. I shall not fear any presence or any power in heaven, on earth, or in hell, for omnipresence is with me. The presence of God goes with me. The presence of God goes before me to make the crooked places straight. The presence of God remains behind me to bless all those who pass that way. The presence of God walks on each side of me, and that makes a complete omnipresence and a complete sense or consciousness of omnipresence. Now that is the first thing that must be achieved. Give up this chase. Give up the search for God and acknowledge, thank you, Father, I've reached. In uh, the infinite way, in the last chapter, New Jerusalem, I am home in thee. It was a wonderful day in 1937 when that realization came. I am home in thee. Well, of course, I had never been away from home, but I didn't know it. It was on that day that I realized I am home. I didn't come home. I hadn't been any place. But I realized I am home in thee. Before this, I was a weary wanderer. I was a searcher for truth until 1937, searching all over the place, and in the libraries, too. I thought he was in library shelves, especially metaphysical libraries. No. All the time, God was in me, and I was in God. But I have never regretted those years of search and those books, either, and the time spent in them because in the end they revealed uh, that which had always been true, that I was home in thee. So let's not tear up those books yet or tear down the libraries yet. But at least let us realize what their function is. Their function isn't to give us God. Their function is to reveal that we are in God and God is in us. We live and move and have our being in God. So let us bless every activity that helps to reveal that to us. That is our point number one. And our point number two is to give up all idea of demonstration. Whether the demonstration is for employment, or income, or companionship, or home, Even the desire for health and for sinlessness. Let's give it all up. Even the desire to be good and pure. Let's give that up too. And let us translate everything into one desire. And that is to realize God's presence. To realize omnipresence. To realize that the place whereon I stand is holy ground that all that the Father hath is mine. You know, after that statement, doesn't it seem strange to still be trying to make demonstrations? All that the Father hath is mine. Only one demonstration to make is the realization of that truth. So let us give up getting health or getting abundance and let us get acquainted with God. At first, it's difficult to get acquainted with God because we think of God in terms of our concept of God. And that's why we never really get acquainted because God isn't like that at all. God isn't like anything that we think God is. And so one of the things, one of the desires that we have to give up is the desire for God in the way we think of God. Let us, above in our giving up, let us give up the kind of a God that we have thought about or visualized or believed in. And let us accept God as God without any idea or outline 
of what it is we're going to meet when we do get acquainted with God. Because we're going to find a different kind of fellow than we ever thought about. It's a different experience. Those who have experienced God, while they can't tell you what that experience is like, they can tell you that God isn't like anything you think God is. And so, it is a good rule to know this. You don't know God. What you're entertaining is a concept of God, an idea of God. Oh, it may be Jesus' concept of God as Father or the Father within, or it may be Paul's concept of God as the Christ, but it's still concept. It's still concept. It may be yours, it may be your parents' concept, it may be your church's concept. And you may have given up your orthodox church's concept of God and accepted a metaphysical concept of God as mind or life or principle. Give those up too. All of those are, are facets of God. We can speak of God as love, but if we do, we're speaking of one of the tiniest little bits of God because love is only one of the many ways in which God presents itself. We can speak of God as mind, but that can't be God because mind is only one of the many, many ways in which God presents itself. We can speak of God as law, but God must be something more than law because law is only one of the many ways in which God presents itself. So instead of thinking of God in some finite, limited way, let us realize that life, truth, love, substance, principle, law, soul, spirit, these are all ways in which God presents itself to us, but God is even greater than the sum total of all of them. And so let us go for the whole vision and... Uh, not be concerned about what we think God is or what we've been taught God is or what our books say that God is. And let us turn with an open mind to the revelation of God, the unfoldment of God in our consciousness and be prepared for it in whatever form it may appear. And be assured of this, to each one it will come in a different way. It will be again the story of the four blind men who had climbed up on an elephant and each was describing the elephant to the others. One had caught hold of his tail, of course, and was telling the others that the elephant was like a heavy piece of rope. And the other one had caught hold of the legs and he was explaining that an elephant is so wide that you can't get both arms around him and so thick and so heavy that you can't move it. But the other one had caught hold of a tusk, and he was saying, why, no, no, it isn't like that at all. It's cold, and it's hard, and so forth and so on. And so each blind man told what the elephant was from his viewpoint. But the elephant actually was more than the sum total of all those things. And so it is with God. I could tell you some of the things and some of the ways in which I have caught glimpses of God, but it would be very incomplete very imperfect because I have no way of explaining allness. You have no way of explaining allness. And allness will appear to you one day one way and another day another way. So let us forget our ideas or concepts of God and turn to the revelation of God itself. Let us turn away from all forms of God, like health and abundance and good, and get acquainted with God. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Well, you know that if you're to be at peace, you will have health, wealth, harmony, and all the other things too, or you wouldn't have peace. So to get at peace means to get acquainted with God. Then all these things will be added. Now our third point today is Put on the armor of oneness. This is one of the greatest points in all spiritual teaching. It is one that is only touched on in the very highest spiritual teachings. It is a revelation of God 
as one, not a statement of God as one, a revelation of God as one. In other words, when we speak of oneness, we're speaking of God's power as the only power. Not as a power that you use over evil powers or to overcome sin or disease with, but as oneness. In other words, to put on the armor of oneness means to be like David going out to meet Goliath. It means to take off that heavy armor of defense because there's no power out there to defend yourself against. And then he proved that Goliath was not a power. He was just a braggart. Because without any armor, in the world sense of armor, and without any of what the world calls its weapons, Goliath is destroyed. The least of these things, a little pebble. No armor, no protection. Now to go out into the world with the armor of oneness means to go out without the sword of offense or the armor of defense. It means to go out without affirmations or denial. Oh, you see, when we were in the realm of armor and swords, that was easy. But now when we come to giving up affirmations and denial, that gets more difficult. But those are weapons of offense and defense. We are trying with uh, our affirmations and denials to destroy sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation. And there isn't any. There isn't any. There's no reality to it. Those are appearances that tempt us into a battle. First, the battle is with armor and swords and guns and bombs. And as you get to be a metaphysician and go into the mental realm, the battle is with thoughts and affirmations and denials. Do you see that? Now, we haven't put on the armor of oneness until we've agreed that God, this is the first commandment of the Ten Commandments and the first of the Master's Commandments, God is the only presence and the only power. Now, as you go out into the world with that, God is one. One life that doesn't have to be saved. One life that doesn't have to be healed. God is one soul that doesn't have to be purified. God is one substance, so there's no bad substance, no evil substance, no too much substance, no too little substance. So you don't need any words to change substance with, or thoughts, any more than you need things. God is one substance. God is the only activity, so there is no evil activity. So we need neither swords, no armor, no words, no thoughts of offense or defense since God is the only activity. And who is there to fear God's activity? Oh, yes, you're going to be tempted. Oh, certainly, maybe at the first street corner there's going to be a man standing with a gun to hold us up. And that is our first temptation either to use physical might to overpower him or to use mental might. But spiritual truth says, stand ye still. The battle is not yours. There's no power but God. There's no activity but God. So let him have his little fun with his gun if he wants. Ah, yes, when atomic bombs are flying, everybody wants to buy a bomb shelter. And uh, those who don't buy physical ones start to use mental ones and build a mental wall around themselves or a mental defense against what? The activity of God? There is no other activity. Certainly the temptation, uh, the world is giving us a temptation of atomic bombs and the world is fearing it. Don't you ever worry about that? You can feel that as you travel the trains and planes, how the world is fearing it. Why, why in a Christian world should one fear when the whole teaching is based on God as the only activity. So uh, bombs can only be another temptation like germs. We in the metaphysical world aren't nearly as afraid of germs as the rest of the world, and so we don't suffer so much from them. 
Well, uh, if they really were power, we would suffer from them. We would have just as many germ diseases, infectious and contagious diseases, as the world had if infection and contagion were power. But we have already come to see that there's no infection and no power in infection and contagion, so we walk in and out among it, and nothing happens. Why? Because if there is such a thing, it's the activity of God. If it isn't, it's just an appearance tempting us to believe in an activity, substance, or presence apart from God. Now, what difference does it make whether it's a tiny germ that we're fearing or a great big bomb? Both of them have the same power and have to kill us in human belief. Can't be too important which way it is if we're going to have to accept the belief. Now, put on the armor of oneness. Face every situation in life with that one word, one. If you're threatened with a bad activity, just smile and remember God is the only activity. Because the only activity, there's only one activity, that's God. If you are threatened with uh, a false sense of substance, too much or too little, smile at it. Remember, since oneness is truth, there's only one substance. There's no evil substance. There's no bad substance. There's no uh, sick substance. There's just one substance, and that's spirit. And so it is, if your life is threatened, smile at it. There's only one life. You can only lose your sense of life by believing that there are two lives. God's life and yours. And that subject you to any temptation or belief in all the world. But the moment you give up all sense of a life apart from God, you have entered immortality and eternality right here on earth. If you are suffering from hate, animosity, jealousy, envy, your only recourse is in the word one. If God is love, there's only one love. There can't be degrees of it. There can't be more of it and less of it. And what's more, there can't be an absence of it, since love always is infinite. Anything pertaining to God is infinite. So if love is of God, love is infinite. And so when you see hate, envy, jealousy, malice, are you seeing something that's there, or are you seeing a temptation to believe that love isn't infinite, or that there's more than one kind of love? And so it is. Put on the armor of oneness. Face every situation and every condition with the word one. One life, one soul, one mind, one being, even one body. You might even be fearing something about your body. But if you ever remember that there is only one body, since there's only one God to be embodied, oh, I know the appearances indicate that each one of us here has a body. And that's why we all seem to be different. Some healthier, some not. Some more, some less. That's because we have accepted the belief of duality, more than one. But if there's only one God and one life, it can only be in one embodiment, and that one is the body of God. Know you not that your body is the temple of God? It doesn't say that each one of us has a temple of God but that our body is the temple of God, your body, my body. The body is the temple of God. Since oneness is the truth, then there's only one body, and uh, that's that. That really covers about nine months' work. Gosh, by then, maybe I can get back. <laughs>